Welcome to lecture two of our introduction to causal inference course. Today's video is going to be part one of this lecture, which is going to be about directed acyclic graphs. So this is the overall structure of the lecture, which is going to be divided in eight videos. Today's video is just going to be a brief introduction to the topic, and we're going to introduce more precise concepts and definitions as we go along the other videos. So what is a DAG? A DAG is an acronym for directed acyclic graph. A DAG is a graph because it is a graphical representation of causal relationships. And as we're going to see throughout the course, being able to represent graphically and visually assumed causal relationships between variables is very, very useful for causal inference. DAGs are directed because cause-effect relationships are represented by arrows. So if I want to indicate that variable X causes variable Y, I'm going to draw an arrow from X into Y. DAGs are also acyclic, which means that they do not form cycles. And at first, this might seem something that's very arbitrary and unwarranted, but it actually makes a lot of sense once we think about it. So to illustrate that, let us consider a cycle here on the slide where variable x causes z, which causes y, which causes x, thus forming a cycle. And why is this a problem? Let's think about it. If x causes z, then we know that x precedes z in time. Similarly, according to this DAG, z precedes y in time, which precedes x in time. But this would imply that x precedes itself in time which is of course impossible, and therefore cycles in a DAG don't make sense, and therefore they are not allowed. So as I said, this video is supposed to be a gentle introduction to DAGs, and I wanted to do that by comparing them to more traditional conceptual models, because those have been around in epidemiology for decades now. So just a few words about those traditional conceptual models. In those models, we organize the variables into hierarchical levels, so we have our outcome, which in this example is infectious disease. We organize its causes into levels. We have the more proximal level, which is indicated here in this example by five, and the more distal level, which is indicated in this example here by one, and all the levels in between. And because we don't need to be explicit about the causal relationships between every pair of variables in the model, the traditional conceptual models are simpler to draw than DAGs. And even though they are simpler and require less assumptions, they are still useful because they allow identifying potential confounders or mediators and etc. But they are less precise than DAGs. And therefore, in some cases, some of the conclusions that we can arrive at using traditional conceptual models actually fail. And we're going to see that in a later video of this lecture. So just to illustrate here, we have a traditional conceptual model on the slide here. We have infectious disease, as I said, as the outcome, and we have five hierarchical levels here. The more distant one is socioeconomic factors, then maternal, reproductive, and environmental factors, and so on, up to the more proximal level of causes. And this classification of distal, intermediate, and proximal levels depends on the assumed relationship between levels. What do I mean by that? I mean here is that, for example, variables in level four can influence or are assumed to influence based on our model, the outcome either directly or mediated by factors in level five. Similarly, variables in level three, which would be gestational factors, could influence the outcome either directly are mediated by factors in level four or mediated by factors in level five. All of this can happen, and similarly for more distal levels. So we organize variables into hierarchical levels according to whether or not variables in one level could influence variables in the next level or levels below it. When we draw a DAG, we need to organize our graph according to explicit causal relationships between variables and therefore DAGs are more complex than traditional conceptual models because they require that causal relationships are explicitly shown. And they're very useful because they allow identifying confounders, mediators, etc., in a way that is more precise than traditional conceptual models. And as I said before, we're gonna see examples of that in future videos. And DAGs are also useful to detect and adjust for other sources of bias in addition to confounding such as selection bias as we're going to see throughout this lecture. 
So here we have an example of a very simple deck. We have four variables here. So we have, for example, variable Z causing variable X, variable X causing variable Y, variable U causing variables X and Y. And notice here that an arrow between two variables simply indicates that one causes the other directly. And by directly, I mean in a way that's not mediated by any other variables in the deck. But absence of an arrow between two variables don't necessarily mean that they're not causally related. For example, consider variables Z and Y here. Notice there is no arrow between Z and Y. Nevertheless, Z does cause Y because Z causes X and X causes Y. Therefore, X is a mediator of the effect of Z on Y. Therefore, presence of an arrow between two variables indicates a direct causal effect between them, a direct causal relationship between them. And notice that both DAGs and traditional conceptual models are both conceptual models. They are both tools that we can use to sort of summarize our knowledge and assumptions about the research question that we are considering. And therefore, both of them must satisfy temporality. So for us to start gaining some understanding about DAGs, let's consider an example where we're going to compare DAGs to more traditional conceptual models. And for this example, we're going to consider the following research question. What is the causal effect of low birth weight on height at 30 years of age? And for simplicity, we're going to assume that the causal contrast is well-defined, so we don't have to worry about that and focus only on the comparison between DAX and traditional conceptual models. And the covariates that we're going to consider when drawing our models are those ones listed here. And again, this might not be a proper set of covariates, but please don't waste too much of your time thinking about it, because my point here is just to compare the two types of models. So let us draw both of them to see the differences and similarities. So here we have a hierarchical conceptual model involving all variables I listed in a previous slide. Notice here that they are organized according to life course, because as I said, none of them can violate temporality. So I have here maternal schooling and family income at birth at the top alongside sex. Then we have low birth weight, which is our exposure, then height at age 10, height at age 30, which is our outcome, and income at age 40. And notice here that I included maternal schooling and family income in the same box. This is just a way to represent that those two variables pertain to the same domain, to a sort of socioeconomic position domain. So what can we conclude about this conceptual model? Well, we can notice that sex, for example, is a potential confounder because as I discussed previously, variables in more distal level may or may not influence variables in levels below it. So the model allows for sex to influence low birth weight and allows for sex to influence height at age 30. The model doesn't postulate that sex does influence those two, but it might influence them. So sex is a potential confounder. Similarly to maternal schooling, because it is located in the most distal level, it can influence directly all other variables below it. So it might influence low birth weight and height at age 30. And we also see here that height at age 10 is a potential mediator because it is located between our exposure and our outcome. But it, since it is not necessarily the case, according to this model, that height at age 10 is caused by low birth weight and that height at age 10 causes height at age 30, those relationships are only possible. So height at age 10 is a potential mediator of the effect of the exposure on the outcome. So now let's consider a DAG about the same example. And please keep in mind, this is just a hypothetical DAG for the purposes of an example. It might not be perfect. We might disagree about some of the arrows I've drawn or some of the arrows I did not draw. Please, again, do not waste too much of your time thinking about it because this is just for illustration. So notice here that in our DAG, sex is a direct cause of low birth weight and a direct cause of height at age 10, which causes height at age 30. And therefore, sex is a confounder because it causes both the exposure and the outcome independently on the exposure. So here the DAG says that sex is a confounder. Notice that in our previous example, sex was a potential confounder, but now the DAG, because it is more explicit, allows us to conclude that sex is indeed a confounder. And notice here that maternal schooling in our DAG is not a confounder because it causes low birth weight, but does not cause the outcome height at age 30 
independently on its effect on the exposure. So maternal schooling is not a confounder. And notice that maternal schooling was a potential confounder in the previous model, but not in the data. That's why I said previously that sex is a potential confounder and maternal schooling is a potential confounder because the model does not explicitly say whether this is the case or not. But in the DAG, those relationships are made explicit. And in the DAG, height at age 10 is a mediator because it is affected by the exposure and it causes the outcome. And again, in the previous model, we just said that height was a potential mediator, but now our DAG makes it explicit that mediation is indeed the case. And in case it's not clear already, it is very important to realize that the arrows we did not include in our DAG are as important, if not more important, than the arrows we did include in the DAG. Let me illustrate this with an example. Consider again the example of maternal schooling. We already concluded it is not a confounder of the effect of low birth weight on height at age 30. But this is because I did not draw in this DAG any arrow that links maternal schooling to height at age 30 other than through its effect on the exposure. Had I included such an arrow, then my interpretation about the role of maternal schooling in the relationship between my exposure and my outcome would be different. So notice here the importance of not drawing an arrow. So it is very important to carefully consider whether or not an arrow should be drawn. There is no neutral position in a deck. When you draw an arrow, you're explicitly stating that there is a direct causal relationship between the two variables. And when you don't draw an arrow, you're explicitly saying that there is no direct causal relationship between them. I hope this introduction to DAGs was useful to you. In the next video, we're going to start talking about DAGs in more detail so we can learn more about their properties and how they can be useful for causal inference. See you then.